All right, boys, happy Monday. Let's dive right into it. Good evening, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to another episode of High Top Sports. It is Monday. It is a fantastic Monday. Knocking off the week, it is the SC Championship this week in basketball. We're going to be talking all about that. Before we dive into that, though, we are going to hop into with Mr. Jake Crane from Crane & Company to talk about the Florida football team, what he thinks they're going to look like. Are you my blue? Do I look blue on your end? <laughs> uh, I mean, it's like a nice turquoise. I mean, you wouldn't, they wouldn't let you in the blue man group, but you'd probably get an audition. I looked down. It completely threw me off my whole whole game here, bro. I was like, wait a minute. Am I sick? Am I, am I not feeling well? Uh, anyways, I'll figure it out while we're chit-chatting, Jake. Jake, welcome to the show. Good to see you, man. We've, we've had you on a couple of times. It was always for high top game day. Never one-on-one like this, so I'm really excited to to chat with you, get to talk to you a little bit, even if I am a little blue. <laughs> look, it's a Florida. It's it's about Florida, so it makes sense. It makes sense. I think I, I look good. So, look, man, uh, happy, happy happy to have you on. You were actually just you projected or you sent you tweeted out the the March Madness or the SEC tournament. I gave you little jabs because you are an Auburn fan, and uh, so we will talk about that. But I do want to just dive right into to the football, right, and kind of get your thoughts and opinions mm-hmm. about it. Obviously, Florida fans, there's a lot of the word flying around is apathy, where people are kind of, you know, not really carried. They're not really excited where the, when they should be. There's a lot of hype coming out of camp, given the fact that with DJ Lagway, LJ McCray, a lot of big time recruits that did end up at the, in this class, even though it didn't end up as a top five class, which all Florida fans wanted, a lot of quality came in. Got some guys to come back, got some great transfers. There is some excitement there for what we call ourselves the Disney Gators. Is there real legitimate excitement that should be there, or or is there should there still be some reserves for fans, and are they right for having those reserves? Well, look, I mean it's Florida, so so there always should be some excitement. You know, there's going to be talent there. Uh, you know, something I say all the time, and and look, we're all a fan of somebody, and and fan is short for fanatical. So you have some people that are always going to think they're going to do better than what they are, and then you have the pessimists that uh, are always thinking they're going to do worse than than what they're going to do. But look, I I mean, you look at returning your quarterback. That's obviously good news. I thought Billy Napier making some moves from a coaching staff standpoint in the offseason shows you that he's trying to make some adjustments after not really, you know, fulfilling what a lot of people thought he was going to do the first couple of years. But, you know, it's it's a combination of things, right? You did lose a lot. You know, I was watching Ricky Pearsall down at the Senior Bowl. You look at some of the, the, you know, turnover you've had up front. Florida's always going to have good players. The question is, are they going to be good enough to do what Florida fans expect them to do? And the standard at Florida, regardless of how it's gone, uh, is championships. Now, you know, sometimes the the standard should never change, but reality should be accepted. You look at that schedule uh, with what they have returning, and it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough for everybody, but, you know, I can make the argument that Florida has one of the hardest schedules I've ever seen, if we're going to be honest, especially with Texas and Oklahoma coming, coming over. But it's not just about the SEC. It's about their non-conference, man, when you look at what they're going to have to do. So I, I think the answer is always somewhere in the middle. You know, I think one of the things with Billy and, and Sheldon, I think you'll agree with me here, is it's not just that you're losing. It's how you're losing and the yeah. optics of how you're losing. You know, you've seen a lot of dysfunction during the games. I mean, I, you go back to the, the first game of last year, Utah. You stop them uh, on a big third down. You get them in in fourth and four, I believe, and you have two guys with the same jersey number on special teams that gives them a first down. What do they do? They go down and score. You you can't. The margin of error is so small, especially with this schedule and how good the teams are that you're playing. You can't have these what I call avoidable or, or controllable mistakes, and I think that's gone into a little bit of that apathy. So, look, uh, am I going to come on here and say that? You know, everybody at Florida should be panicking right now. Oh, my God, it's it's a natural disaster. It's DEFCON 1. No. Am I going to come on here and say, you know what? It's going to be fine, guys. That They're going to be fine. There's going to be no problems. They may have the best team in the country. No. The question is, and I know we'll get into it a little bit more, is can Billy use the narrative of nobody believes in us, like we've seen with a Kirby Smart team that, that you know, ended up winning a national championship. Nobody thought they were going to go 8-4, and four, but he somehow convinced his players, and Nick Saban did the same thing. Can Billy Napier tap into that uh, and be able to use that to drive this Gator team? And look, players win games. It'll always be that way. But if they can stop with with the stupid mistakes in big moments, Florida's going to have a chance to win some games people don't think they're going to have a chance to win. I agree. I think you're nailed on the head. We talk about it constantly. It's how they lost. And that's where the frustration yeah. sets in. And that's where the apathy sets in. Because, look, I think we, we try to defend, I at least myself. I think what excites me is the talent is there. You, you can't look past what is there. I think, and I've been 
beating this drum with Graham Mertz coming back. And I want to kind of tap into that a little bit as well, too, get your opinions on that. I think the narrative is starting to turn around on that. Of When you take a look at this schedule, the pro mm-hmm. for Florida is the schools that are, although they're bringing in talented quarterbacks, it is their, that first year in that system, which we saw what it was last year. There could be some hiccups, not necessarily with the quarterback, with the entire thing in, in general. But yes, can Billy tap into that you know, us against the world mentality. Mm -hmm. That's one question mark that we as fans have had too is does he have that dog in him? And people don't like when I say that, but (laughs) does he have the swagger to carry this team and get him fired up? Well, that's the biggest question to me. Look, it's not that Billy Napier doesn't understand football. It's not that he doesn't understand schematically what's he want, what he wants to do, the system he wants to run. You've got to know offense to know defense. You got to know defense to know offense. Special teams is a weird combination of the two, but Billy knows that. But it's not just. There's a lot of guys that are great play callers that are great schematically that never won games because either a they couldn't recruit the players to be able to run the system, or b when they got them in they couldn't find a way to motivate them to be able to accomplish what their talent or or potential uh, could be. You know, I I think that's the biggest question. It's hard for me to sit here and say yes, Shelton, after what I've seen. I mean, it'd be going off blind faith. But when you look at what Billy did leading up to this point, when you look at at the equity that he built up in the Sun Belt and waited for for the right job to come along and he took it. He's had success doing it before. And I mean, listen, the Billy Napier that you see in the media and in the press, it's going to be a lot different than the Billy Napier you see behind closed doors. I'm not in any of those team meetings. I'm not watching him get after anybody's ass at practice. So it's hard for me to come out and say, you know, one way or the other. But, But I do believe this. I think Billy Napier is unbelievably competitive. I think he was like that as a player. I think he's like that as a coach. I think he wants to surround himself and build a culture that obviously breeds an unbelievable competitive nature. And to do that, you've, you've got to be able to tap into the individual. It's not just about the team. It's not just the rah-rah speech before the game. I mean, hell, that lasts a play. Once you snap the ball, then it becomes about the game. But when I look at, at, at Billy Napier, is he going to be able to turn all this negativity that's surrounding the program right now or apathy or whatever you want to call it and turn that into a catalyst for Florida to be able to go out there and, for lack of a better term, be a little bit pissed off and go kick somebody's ass. That's what this game is about. I look at Florida's roster. I look at the recruiting class they bring in. I look at them bringing back Graham Mertz. Yeah, they've lost a couple pieces, but at the end of the day, you play in the swamp. You represent Gainesville in the state of Florida. You are the state school. At some point in time, you got to stop feeling sorry for yourself, and you got to go out there and take what's yours. And is Billy Napier going to take that step with this group? And maybe it takes a little bit of getting beaten down all the time to bring that out of somebody, uh, coaches included. We'll see what this new staff he brought in. I like Ron Roberts a lot to go along with Armstrong uh, there at the D.C., uh, even though, to be honest with you, Shelton, everybody talks about the offense. Florida's got to get him out of the bottom of the conference in these defensive rankings. That's a lot. That, that's really what's been killing him, if we're going to be honest. Not that they can't put competent offensive drives together. It's every time they go score, they give up a score. Or every time they don't score, it's a big moment. They find a way to lose the game. And you've got to get that out of people. Can Billy Napier do that? The jury's still out. This isn't the best schedule to do it. But I tell you what, at the end of the day, you want to be able to pl- you want to be playing good opponents, especially early if you've turned the tables. Now all of a sudden you're using that schedule and saying, "Hey, well they beat these guys, they beat these these guys. Maybe this Florida team is for real." And in a 12 team playoff, you're going to start hearing the term "bubble" a lot. You're going to start hearing the term "strength the schedule" a lot. I mean, we got March Madness right around the corner. You're going to get a little bit of a similar dose of that in college football. But it starts in the weight room. It starts on the practice field. It starts with guys going to class. It starts with guys treating people the right way on and off the field. If you can do that, I do think Florida has enough talent to go out there and put a good showing enough together to keep Billy Napier around for another year. You got me fired up talking about playing. Well, I mean, off. Shelton, here's it's it's Florida. <laughs> yeah, it's no, look. Florida. We're not talking about we're not talking about James Madison, and I know they've been they've done a great job. We're not talking about UC Santa Barbara. This is Florida. When I grew up. And look, like I said, we're all a fan of somebody. I watched Cody Burns go down there in the swamp and beat Tim Tebow and that that group. You know, Auburn's had a decent amount of success against Florida. But every time I see them on the schedule, it gives you a little chill in your spine because you know what Florida's really about. That's what's so weird, watching them struggle the way that they have struggled, not only under Napier, but under Muschamp as well. At some point, football's cyclical. you got to turn it. And Florida's a brand that when they get hot, 
They can get white hot. They can get electric hot. Somebody just got to flip the damn switch. It's not all about how pretty you look. It's not all about how many Instagram followers or how much that what NIL deal you did with the air conditioning company in Gainesville. It is a it is a field that is a hundred yards long and it's fifty three and a third yards wide. And when Florida gets off the bus, they ought to be able to run with anybody. And they got to start getting a little bit of that swag back, a little bit of that. You know, oh, I know Georgia's good. I know Bama's good. I know Tennessee's looking better. But this is Florida. Start acting like it. All right, guys. Appreciate you stopping by. And <laughs> yeah, it's just the truth, though. I, I I love, come on this. Look, this, you're gonna yeah, fire them up, baby. I this is love a Furman it. broadcast to be a little bit different. My hat's going all over the place. You got me all fired up, Shelton. Hey, when the hair, hey, look, I, I commented that one. When the hair starts flopping, you know shit's serious. And if, if the hat For was sure. off, who knows what would have happened? You would have been. I mean, what, what's I don't the know, band? man. It's like, listen, I, I grew up in a household <laughs> that after the game, there's two holes in the wall and we won by 10. <laughs> Look, I, you're spot on. And I think you, you nailed it on the head. And that's where that energy, I, I'm, I think that'll fire some of the apathy that was back into it when people start, you know, when they, when they get a clip of this, because <laughs> you're, you're spot on. I think exactly right. Florida is Florida football. It's close to being, or it should be a lot closer to being what that white hot is, man. And uh, <laughs> you got me fired up, man. I'm ready for some football. To, well, I mean, to Shelton, you grew up with it, man. I mean, yeah, no, Florida 100%. should strike the fear of God in people when they get off the bus. You ought to turn that tape on. It ought to be like watching The Conjuring. You ought to be watching like this. Yeah. No, it, it's, it's definitely gotten away from that. And I think, again, going back to Billy, you mentioned something about how he waited to go for the perfect job, kind of played his cards Bought it on himself, right? Because he had a lot of job offers before he left Louisiana. Doubled down on who he was to get a better offer. And that's kind of his personality. I think you were kind of alluding to, like, he hasn't really, I would say, adjusted from his plan these first two years, which has irritated a lot of people. But, and I've, I've said this as well, I was like, look, you have to have that ego. You have to have that belief as a head coach that I'm going to run my routine because this is what I know and it's worked for me in the past. It may not be what you like, and you may not like how we get there, but ultimately we all want the same thing. As in my way, it has gotten me there before, and obviously this is going to be the striking year. And like you said, this may not be the schedule to do it, but I will. I, I gotta argue. I feel like the guys that are there that stuck around that stayed, they're buying in. And like you also said, which I've been beating the drum, and some people are like, "Hey, why are we getting excited about strength and conditioning? Why are we getting excited about these things?" I believe we lost a lot of these games last year. Right now, when we were getting pushed around in the fourth quarter. We just we didn't look gas. We were we had to we could run around with the best of the best of them, but we were just getting beat, just straight up, just manhandled. Yeah, and that happens right now. Well, look, and and we say this all the time on Crane and Company on on the show we do. And uh, look, games are not won during fall camp. If you're waiting to fall camp to get guys fired up or build that team unity or or you know get the culture where it's supposed to be, then you've already lost. I mean, you're you're already walking. You know uphill in a, in a mountain of snow. I mean, it starts in winter workouts. Then it goes into, into spring. Then it goes into summer. Then you get to fall camp. Hell, fall camp should almost be a reward at this point because of all the work that you put in before that. And listen, talent is going to win a lot of games, and Ford is very talented. But th there's a reason that football is the ultimate team sport, right? If you're able to move as one organism, you can have success and make up for a couple shortcomings. Is Florida going to have the best roster on the field against the top teams that they play this year? No, I think we can all agree on that. But they're good enough where if they go out there and play well and they keep their foot on the gas and they put game pressure on other teams, they can win some of these games. But but you forge your team, like you said, right now. It's, and it's not even about guys lifting together. Obviously, strength and conditioning is a big part of it. It's a gladiator sport. It's guys going and hanging out. It's going and getting chicken fingers and french fries together. It's going to, to other families, you know, uh, uh, holidays and, and hanging out and playing video games and, and, you know, bringing that togetherness to where when it's fourth and one on either side of the ball, I can look my, my teammates in the eyes and know we're going to get it because we've earned it. And you know, deep down, you can fool a lot of people. You can fool a lot of people. You cannot fool yourself, and you cannot fool your teammates. And I think Florida is at the point now where you can use that us-against-the-world mentality, and Billy Napier can use it too. Oh, they want me to get through this year, uh, through the hardest schedules. They can fire me and bring in another guy to, to try and turn it around. I'm not going to let that happen. We're going to turn it around this year. Now, does that mean Florida's going to go 11-1? and one? I don't think so. But if he goes out there and goes 8-4 and four, or somehow finds a way to go 9-3, and three, now all of a sudden that pendulum flips. 
right? And and I think that's something that this team can do. But yeah, the team is built during the off season. The team is forged during spring and summer and winter workouts. And then by the time you get to fall camp, you know, you're teaching a little bit of the base install stuff to the young guys, but but you're getting guys ripping, roaring, and ready to go. So yeah, I mean, you're exactly right. It'll always be that way. Yeah, and I think, and that's where it's exciting to me. I feel like some changes were made. Clearly, got a new strength and conditioning coach. He bolted out of town pretty quickly. But the guy they brought in too, which kind of alludes to what you were just saying, it was a a promoted within based on the the fan. I don't know if you heard Tyler Miles. He got promoted because the 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 players wanted him. They were just basically just. Uh, preaching for him, like, hey, this this is our guy. We we want him to be it. So they keep saying like a player recognition promotion, which is great in my opinion for a role like that. Is everything that you just spoke about, right? You're buying into the person that is leading you for a good you know front half of the season. So it's bigger than I believe than what people were probably realizing. Just because it is strength and conditioning, nobody thinks about it. The casual fan just tunes in on August and like let's rock and roll. But like we just said, it starts now, and I think they're they're making the right steps. Obviously, you still got to play football games, and I get that, but there is, I feel like, again, for the last three years, we always have this exciting little buzz. It, it feels a little more organized in a weird way. Well, yeah, look, the strength and conditioning coach spends more time with the players than any of the other coaches. I don't think a lot of people who haven't been in it re- realize that. Yep. The, the second most important hire, or really the most important hire a head coach makes, and any head coach worth his salt will tell you that, is the strength and conditioning coach. Yeah, because he has to build their bodies up, right? You don't want guys getting hurt. You want guys to be able to push the envelope against the other team. You want them to be able to to have that endurance, to be able to make that last push during the fourth quarter. But it's also culture. It's also mindset. Uh, It's, you know, know, it's, it's it's running through the line. It's not having your toe over the line before you start. It's all those small things that add up to not having two guys with the same jersey number. On punt return, it's it's football is a lot of little things that turns into one big thing. Now, the biggest question to me, Shelton, with this team from a mindset standpoint and from a culture standpoint, is it hasn't gone your way really the past couple of years. What happens if it doesn't go great early? And you start hearing those whispers and the fans start saying, oh, here we go again. Uh, the season's done. The season's lost. How much confidence? Right, and how much sway does that leadership on the team have to be able to regroup guys and get it back to where it's supposed to be? Because there's no guarantee it's going to go good early, and everybody's excited in the off season. Hell, we only get 12 regular season games in this sport. We have this build up, this you know, recruiting and the off season, and now the transfer portal. We have this huge build up where people are like, "Oh, I'm ready to be hurt again," and then you know, it's like that Fansville commercial. It's like all of a sudden they start freaking out watching the game, and the guy looks at him and goes, hey, man, that, that was just the first play of the season. You've got to be able to withstand the bad early this year if you're Billy Napier as well because it's not going to get any easier, and that goes back to what we're talking about, the strength and conditioning coach. When it was hard, were you able to push through? Were you able to push through together? A coach's job is to push a player further than they can push themselves, just like a parent's job is. So, uh, again, if the players are wanting it, Typically, they're not going to lie about it, uh, especially at this level. So it does feel like it's a good move. I like the moves he made on defense as well, like I mentioned earlier. You know, d- no disrespect to Corey Raymond or any of those guys, but you needed to make a change to show that that you know it's not going and not living up to the standard that Florida fans and and the community expects. I do want to talk, pick your brain about that a little bit too, because there was a lot of uh, there was feedback on the coaching hires and the changes that were made. Again, a lot of criticism on the offensive side, given the fact of two offensive linemen. Or, uh, coaches, the offensive line finishing 131st out of 132nd, unacceptable. A lot of people calling for the offensive coordinator position for Billy's head. He did promote Russ uh, Russ Callaway as a co-offensive coordinator. Now, if he's going to hand the reins over completely, we don't know about that yet. But like you mentioned earlier, it was the defense that was really bringing things down. Offensively, top 50 in the country, they weren't missing on all cylinders. Offensive line, another question, but offense as a whole wasn't completely missing. I mean, we, we, we ranked horribly on defense. Talk about the hires, and then I want to pick your brain, especially on Rod Roberts, given the fact that he is from uh, from Auburn last yeah. year as an individual conversation. Well, I, I think they made a lot of upgrades in in some areas. I mean, th- there was a lot of turnover in that coaching staff. The good news is, from the offensive line standpoint, you know, yeah, you had a guy go to the league, you had a couple guys transfer, obviously Nebraska to Florida State, but guess what? It can't get mu- can't get much worse. You know, I tell I, I tell you know fans all the time, just. <laughs> Just because you return experience doesn't mean it's good experience. 
you know, I can bring back the same car I had in 2023, but if the damn thing doesn't start, it doesn't matter. Or if I can't drive it down the road, it doesn't matter. You want good experience returning. Uh, and I think Florida, with some of the younger guys that they've developed, some of the moves that they've made through the transfer portal up front, uh, like I said, it can't get much worse, and you still finish top 50. Now, on the defensive side of the ball, I like the Ron Roberts hire for a couple reasons. I think he brings a little bit of a different aspect to how he goes about things, especially on third down and passing, you know, third down and five and above, uh, as compared to what we've seen uh, with Coach Armstrong there. He can be very exotic in his blitzes, and he does less with more than Charmin Ultra. Auburn couldn't rush the passer if you gave him 14 guys on defense last year, yet he found a way to hold some big-time offenses down, right, including Georgia until the fourth quarter, really, Alabama. I just hope he's worked on his fourth and goal from the 31 defense. That, that's, that's a story for another <laughs> that's day. Playbook, but yeah, I th <laughs> yeah but, but I think him bringing that experience uh, to Coach Armstrong and, and the rest of this staff, not that the staff doesn't have, doesn't have experience, but Ron's been in this thing a long time. There's not going to be anything that he hasn't seen. There's not going to be a situation that he hasn't been through where it's gone good and then situations he hasn't been through where it's gone bad. So I do like the adjustments on the coaching staff. If not for you, just you had to mix it up, right? I mean, it's funny. You, you hear some fans complain, oh, well, why are we letting all these guys go? We don't need to make all these changes. And then you have, like, South Carolina's fans are like, why isn't everybody fired? You made no changes, so is this acceptable? We're not going to know until we know. But I trust Billy to be able to evaluate coaches, you know, going into year three. He knows what to expect from the Southeastern Conference. The biggest question I have when we look at the offense, and this is where having Graham Mertz is really a big feather in the cap, especially now that he's back healthy again, is that you don't want to get in this war of play calling. Now, I, I think people don't realize, unless you've been on a headset, yes, there's one final voice that calls the plays, but play calling is a group effort. You have the assistant coaches, whether they're in the booth or they're on the sideline, they're all looking at certain spots. So you as a play caller are getting feedback on, hey, you know, tight ends coach, you're up in the booth. You're watching what the safeties are doing. What do we need to do? What do you like here, right? It's And so it's a team effort, and I like the guys he's surrounded himself with. But at the end of the day, if I'm Billy Napier, just like if I'm Hugh Freeze, just like if I'm Steve Sarkeesian, just like if I'm any head coach that got that job because of my play calling, if I'm going to go down, I'm going down on my own shield. It's because of the plays that I called. I don't, I can't look in the mirror or lay my head on the pillow at night knowing, man, Maybe it could have been different if I would have called this play, or maybe it could have been different if I had a little bit more control over the play calling in the first three or four games. I watched Gus Malzahn and Auburn go through this for what seemed like an eternity. Like it was a purgatory of, well, I'm going to call the plays, and I'm not going to call the plays. I'm going to call the plays, and I'm, well, I'm just going to call a couple of the plays. Why are me and uh, you know my coaching staff almost coming to blows before the game about play calling? You make a decision, and you stick with it. But it's a team effort, and we're gonna see. We don't know yet. We, we've got to see it on the field. It's all conjecture right now. That's the biggest thing I've been I'm beating the drum on too. Is that I think he's made a ton of changes, all for the right reasons. Because a lot of the criticism was he's had too many things on his plate. I feel like he has handled those accordingly with the hire of Mark Robbins and Mark Robinson in the front office staff, which he alluded to talking about managing NIL a little bit. But for you as an Auburn fan and Mark Roberts leaving as your defensive coordinator, you still had a lot of great things outside the fourth and thirty-one. From a fan, look, I think, and it's not that, hey, you're glad that he's gone or one way or the other. I still think it's an upgrade for Florida, given his position at Florida. But was it a loss for Auburn, or were you good, happy to see him go or indifferent? It just, it's Because, again, there's a lot of question marks of, like, how are we getting this defensive coordinator? Is it that bad there? But I didn't feel Auburn's defense was that uh, atrocious last year. I thought it was actually it upgraded. No, no I, I thought it was the best part of the team. Yeah. You know, and <laughs> again, I that, look, I mean, and, and he's not – look at the NFL draft. It's not going to be littered with Auburn players on defense, yeah. right? It's really tough to survive when you can't rush the passer. I mean, there was a lot of games where Auburn brought a knife to a gunfight, but somehow Ron Roberts set the knife on fire and used it like Optimus Prime's flaming sword. It kept Auburn in games a lot. I mean, even going back to Cal. Uh, now, were they perfect? No, nobody's going to be perfect. But I think Ron Roberts, again, you know, bringing that experience what will add, I think, some you know, a couple more chapters to the novel of the the story of Coach Armstrong and his his tenure at Florida. Not that he's going to be the guy, but he's going to be very integral in what Florida does. And listen, sure. it's not just play calling; it's preparation, it's practice structure. Maybe he did some things that he can show Coach Armstrong that he liked 
Hell, maybe even in pre-practice, the way meetings are set up, the way that film is cut up. There's so much that goes into that. That's why that experience is so important. Now, when it comes to the Auburn situation, I was kind of indifferent to it. Um, I think Ron Roberts needs to stay off social media. Uh, he's got a bad problem of, of chirping with fans on social media or, or sports media personalities. That just that, that doesn't help anybody. It creates mm. a distraction. I mean, look, dude, you're you're an older guy. Just just coach the defense, right? Just stay off social media. You don't, you're not trying to turn into a Twitter star or an Instagram star. But I think he knows that. I think a lot of that was just frustration, knowing that the defense was overperforming uh, and people were still pissed off and, and throwing some blame his way. But outside of that, I've got nothing but good things to, to say about the guy. I think he's a very smart defensive mind. Uh, he does a good job of mixing stuff up. Like, you know, like I said, I think his exotic pressure packages because he had to in, he had to Willy Wonka his way through last year. <laughs> okay, like he just he had to. It wasn't like, you know what? We're just going to line up and kick your ass, which is what a lot of, you know, Georgia can do that. They can line up and say, you know what? Well, and they don't. Kirby's unbelievably intricate in what he does, but they could line up and say, look, we'll run base and then we'll run two man on third down. Beat us. Be better than us. We have the seven footer. You don't. Uh, he couldn't do that at Auburn. So I think that does give a couple more bullets in the chamber for what Ford wants to do on defense. But yeah, they got a good one and they got him in a role that, that isn't a defensive coordinator. So he's really just to add on. He went from the burger uh, to the tomato, the lettuce and the mayonnaise. And that's not a terrible thing. <laughs> yeah. Look, and that's, and so look, here's for the, the, the haters on the Disney. And I, I love this. This is going to be a really, I'm you're giving me ammo. The, the, the non Disney gators are going to be upset, but they're calling him the babysitter <laughs> to Austin Armstrong. And I get it, right? It's a big babysitter, but <laughs> Ultimately, for me, it's again, I was like, if you look at his experience at Auburn, it was kind of a head scratcher of how Billy pulled this off. But it sounds like there may have been some personal issues. Again, kind of he's stuck in the situation. He was trying to get things figured out. Wasn't really wrong place, wrong time kind of thing. Not not lack of coaching or lack of handling situation, more of on a personnel type. And he has a relationship with Armstrong and Billy. So that's going to be out of the way. But ultimately, he brings a ton of experience, like you said, and more bullets to the chamber which is what Florida needs ultimately. Yeah, this Disney Gators thing, you got to fill me in on that. What What is that? Yeah, welcome. Um, it, it's optimistic, I guess. Being up, optimistic about the outcome, constantly being pro of Florida and and just, I guess, not wanting Billy to be fired every 30 seconds. I, I think it's what, what it, like, I'm not yeah. over here. I have realistic expectations. Well, I think that I just, I get claimed or proclaimed as this Disney Gator because something happens and I try to look at the glass half full and the glass half empty and it's a delusional look yeah. apparently. Well, well, look, you got it. And again, asking fans to like, and I get, like you said, hey, you man, know, they're you know, be, be realistic. Like uh, that's, that's never going to, that'll never happen. Sure. But you know, you can still talk about it. You got to be able to walk and chew gum. At the same time, right? The, the sky isn't falling, but it isn't the greatest day of the year right now. I mean, the answer is somewhere in the middle. I think you got to just kind of take it as it comes. One of the biggest things for Florida right now, outside of obviously going out there and, and getting a lot out of spring practice, is staying healthy. That's that's a big part as well. You, you've got to catch some breaks. So when, when, you're, when you're breaking down everything, or, or if you're a fan on the outside looking in, I, I – you know, and maybe it's the plan, maybe it's the coaching. You never want to get too high. You never want to get too low. Um, and, and you always want to kind of go with your gut and your instinct about things. But again, they can call it Disney Gator. They can call it Cooking Channel Gator, Weather Channel Gator. I, I don't know. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I do believe that Florida will always have a chance to compete. And you know what? Sometimes it's okay to see the good in things. All we do, I just feel like Joaquin Phoenix on the Joker. It's like nobody's civilized anymore. We just treat each other so <laughs> yeah. awful. It's brought like on. it's just, it's, it's that's what it God. feels like. It's yeah, like, but again, like, well, I always say this: what drives me nuts sometimes about people in in not just sports media, but in media alone. Like some people are just either one of two ways: either it's always good, like it's never bad, like oh the campus caught on fire. Well, uh, you know, we need a little more carbon in the atmosphere, you know, or it's it's. Oh no, the campus caught on fire. Just bur let the thing burn uh, and let's start from scratch. Like the again, the answer is always somewhere in the middle. You just have to adjust to everything that 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 comes as it comes. So again, we'll see. But uh, yeah, there's nothing wrong with being excited. That's what this time of year is built around. Exactly. Being excited. Look, I'm a Braves fan. My body's ready. Go Braves. Okay. Baby. I'm ready to be hurt again, Shelton. Oh, dude. All right. So I'm like, so ready. The, the World Series allows for us. I feel like to endured a little but it got to the point where the heartbreak was like almost part of it 
You know what I mean? And then again, this is what yeah. I told everybody too. It made when they when they won the World Series, it was I was an emotional wreck. It just makes it so much sweeter. The heartbreak, the the the, the progress, it makes it better. It, it doesn't well, seem here, like it in the moment. Yeah. But then, then well, it, honestly, I, I remember the heartbreak more than the World Series. Like it just the build up. You're like, man, remember this? Remember the Chipper Jones game? They're throwing everything on the football field, the or the baseball game. They're throwing everything on the, to the baseball field to walk right. Like those, that was 2010. Wait, <laughs> 14 years well, ago. And I would tell Florida fans this. And I I know you want you want it all every year, and you should, right? That why is the SEC become the monster that it is? It's because pretty much everybody outside of Vanderbilt, who we just keep to be able to point and say, look, we care about school too. That they feel like that they should win it every year. That's part of it. Just means more. It isn't just a slogan for the teams. And I'll tell Florida fans this: y'all have had it good. Y'all imagine being a Nebraska fan, right? <laughs> imagine being a Tennessee fan. I know they turned it on two years ago, but they haven't won anything in forever, right? You had Tim Tebow. I mean, you had Urban Meyer running the checkup. You won it two years in a row in college basketball. I know we're going to get to that. Not saying that that makes everything okay if it's going bad now, but I, it could be worse. It could be worse. Just remember sure. that. It, it def definitely can be. So, look, I, and I think you're spot on. And, and that's the, the point of it, too, is that, look, you brought up early on, too. There's frustrations of how we're losing. I, I, I talk about all of those things, but it also, it's where it excites me because I feel like the things that we're missing on, thankfully, are easy Say, fixes. They're fixable. They're, they're so fixable. fixable. And guess so what? Fixable. Graham Mertz? Graham Mertz isn't Dog. the Beaver Cleaver Simon Birch that a lot of us thought he was going to be. I Good. mean, he's, he's Good. Good. He can do it. Good. You got that piece built around it. Eugene Wilson is a witch. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, y'all's running back situation. I know ETN's gone, but it's not like it's a horrible situation there. Diamond doesn't, and Jake. Am I right? Much, Diamond much doesn't. Worse on the Next guy line. up. Di yeah, look, good. I would much rather, I would much rather be worried about who you have at running back as opposed to just everything else up front. Now, there's some holes, right, that Florida has to fill up front, but you finished almost dead last last year it, and still finished top 50 in offense. Like, Crazy. imagine what happens if you just do half spots. of that. Yeah. yeah, that's it. It's really that easy. <laughs> it's and that and that to me again. It's like you uh, now people are kind of completely sold on Billy, and that's the other part of it too. Like they they don't believe this guy can can find his his shoe from his ass. I'm like that's fine. Like I can't. I'm not gonna sit here and try to convince you otherwise. Again, it's just focusing on there. There were small things we made progress on. There was areas we took setbacks, but again, the things we took step back on, there's such easy 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 fixes. And look, that's where I get excited. Look, I love it. This is a great conversation. Uh, where do you put? Let me get a, a prediction for the season, a record prediction, and then where do you where do you put oh. Graham Mertz? And because two four seven just dropped their top twenty five quarterbacks, Graham was nowhere to be found. A little a little upset, yeah. a little disrespectful. Top twenty five. Look, Graham Graham Mertz isn't a sexy pick to put up there. Okay, like, like sure. a lot of people are. There's a lot of guys that you know off the top of your head you put ahead of Graham Mertz. But you know what? Good. If I'm a Florida fan, please piss Graham Mertz off as much as possible. Leave him off every list. Don't put him in any trophy watch. <clears throat> or, hell, put him on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted. Like, <laughs> I'd almost rather have him on there than, than have him on one of those lists. Uh, now, when it comes to record prediction, here's what I do want to say, Shelton. And I've got no problem with giving a record prediction. But there's a reason that we don't do our, our predictions until after fall camp right before the year. And, and I'll give you a couple of reasons why. One, transfer portal. Who the hell knows? Like who that's going to open up after spring? Who knows? I, I've got no idea what's going to happen in the transfer portal because you find out a lot about your team during the spring and you may want to plug some of those leaks in the ship with the transfer portal. Or you who lose wins a what few. job. You create some. Or you lose a few, yeah. right? Uh, uh, who wins what job? There's surprises every spring, just like there's surprises every fall camp. And then you hit on it injuries so right now i've got florida at five and seven which to be honest with you i think is very charitable compared to what some other people are going to have them as but i'm not going to sit behind a prediction yet until i know exactly who's won what job exactly who's hurt right the left tackle could go down tomorrow you never know could change the whole dichotomy of the team right the center that, that you replaced y'all's with could go down tomorrow change the whole dichotomy of the team so um I don't want to put a concrete prediction in, not that I'm afraid of it, but I like to make, if I'm going to make a guess, it's going to be the most educated guess possible. Where's the weatherman before D-Day? I need to make the most educated guess possible before we light these bad boys up.
And <coughs> I have to stick behind your picks be, or your 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 predictions and your thoughts and your scientists because we had you on for high top game day. You get in the kitchen, you cook up a juicy one. So I know you're gonna put it with a lot of love. I actually give you a lot of. I mean, this I say this every time, but our relationship, if you want to call it that, started by me giving you shit for Auburn and predicting to go eight and five. They finished seven and five, six and six. Uh, six and seven lost the bowl game. Bowl, the yeah, bowl. the bowl game was smosh posh, but uh, the New Mexico yeah, State game was bowl game now. Yeah, yeah. This the New Mexico New Mexico game was not on your <laughs> your bingo card for taking. No, that. no. So. God, I wish because I'd have bet it and probably won a lot of money. <laughs> so, but look, I think you you had eight and five. I was bla- just frustrated because the love for Auburn I feel is a little unwarranted because I feel like they're in the same boat in the sense from a recruiting standpoint. And just rotation with coaches over the last few years, as Florida has, but mm-hmm. there's a there's still a lot of buzz for Auburn. People love Auburn. Yeah. Well, uh, well, a lot of it was. It's amazing what coaches have done in their first year at Auburn. When you go back and look at it, and and you had Georgia and Bama at home, and in reality, you know, of of course, if if should have could have had two of them. Had, yeah, yeah. If if my aunt had nuts, she'd be my uncle. I mean, if ifs and buts were candy nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. You ended up losing those games, but um, you know, I, I <clears throat> my biggest thing was you take the New Mexico State game and one game off. Right. And and actually, you know, it would have been a little bit closer. You throw the bowl game in there, or whatever. Nowadays it really doesn't matter outside of what used to be the New Year's six and then obviously the college football playoff, which, you know, who who the hell knows by the time of, of how many teams are gonna have in the playoff. But, you know, this year I'm I'm very skeptical. Very skeptical on Auburn because I don't trust Peyton Thorne. Uh you gotta go to Georgia, you gotta go to Bama. Look, it's never easy and it's never an easy schedule in the SEC. I always laugh when people are like, oh, well, their schedule's pretty easy this year. It's hey, like, have you lost your have you, mind? Have you like, seen Mizzou's? <laughs> that, that, that thing's well, pretty- well, well, listen, <laughs> I'm not saying that every schedule is equal. It's not. Sure, but there's, there's no the such thing as as an easy schedule. There's lighter ones and there's heavier ones. I mean, you look at Florida's schedule, it's like getting jumped by dwarf ninjas with aluminum <laughs> right. baseball bats when you walk inside the house. I mean, it's just horrifying. You don't know where it's they're fun, coming though. from. I'm excited for it. I, I, I like it's Look, it's dauntingly it, exi- exciting. It's like it's like my dad used to say, and he was saying we got done playing. At least I ain't got to take the hits anymore. <laughs> That's true. It's that for especially fun for everybody else. So look, I'm glad, not glad, but I'm glad that we can kind of see eye to eye. Like I'm not trying to hate on. I have no beef with Auburn. It's just more, well, I'm, it's been created because I'm like, where? What am I missing? What? <laughs> well, I, I mean, look, everybody's a fan of somebody. I, I think one of the reasons our show's done so well is that, like, look, I mean, I'll tell you I'm an Auburn fan. I was born and raised there, and my father played there. Like, if you're not a fan of somebody, then I feel like you should be federally investigated. Yeah, what are you doing? Weird. I don't trust you. Yeah. But it's one thing to be a fan of somebody, and it's another thing to let your bias, if you're in the business that we are, cloud your judgment. Dude, I, I coached for, for 10 years, six, almost seven at the Division One level. I, I love Auburn. I hope Auburn wins every game. They haven't sent me a check yet. The way I pay my mortgage is not on how well Auburn does, right? It's how well I'm able to analyze what teams are going to do, how how well they're going to do from what I know. And look, I think when you've, when you've seen how the sausage is made, it takes a little bit of that that luster off of the, you know, the wide-eyed, you know, mm. oh my gosh, my team, this my team. Um, but yeah, they ain't sent me a check yet. And to be honest with you, I mean, nobody was harder on Brian Harson than me, if we're going to be honest. I mean, it was, uh, I caught a lot of hell early, but caught a lot of love late for that one because I could smell that one from a mile away. <laughs> That's a good point. When you when you see how it's made, you, your opinion about it changes and, and you lose the different. Like if I knew exactly how like some of the restaurants prepared the food, I if I went into a that. fast food kitchen, <laughs> like and saw the way you would that, eat there. I, I probably would not eat there. It would lose. I would. Lo- it would lose its luster. I would probably just cook my own food. But guess what? I guess what? Know. A lot of people don't. They don't. Yeah. I'm not going back there. I'm just going to pretend that y'all really cared about it and everybody washed their hands. My uh, my buddy worked at McDonald's and he's like, "Hey, I'm like, I don't. I don't want to know. I'm just just stay stop. Stop. I appreciate yeah. my quarter no, pounder dude, of cheese. Don't ruin, ruin it for this me. for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's I, like, listen. I know my parents made me by doing it, but I don't want to actually walk in on them while they're doing it. It's just just <laughs> totally different things. You just up my just up my. <laughs> Well, it's like, I know, look, like, I don't need to know all the details, I dog. It. I love it. This is great. This is fantastic. Uh, Jake, let's talk one more thing before you, you go. I do appreciate you hopping on here, man. And again, tell them where they can find you. At. I got it down there at the bottom uh, for you at uh, Jake Crane underscore. Is that right? Well, if you, if you watched me uh, in my illustrious debut on High Type Sports Game Day uh, with the professor and, and Ty and the whole group, it looked like my man came before. It looked like I was basically kidnapped by the North Koreans. Let's be honest. <laughs> yeah. uh, that's what it looked like. Now, my wife, I got to give her credit. 
set up the, the one of my Christmas presents was was the man cave, which is super duper dope. I got a beer fridge over there. Let me point over here that I had to turn off because it makes really loud noises, but it does keep the beer cold. Yeah, but if you want to find us, it's really easy. We do a old school sports show. If you grew up watching Sports Center reruns three times in a row, I think you're going to like what we do. Uh, go to YouTube. It's Crane and Company, C R A I N N Company. We're on Apple Podcasts, we're on Spotify, all that stuff. We go live in the morning, 7 30 a.m. to 9 a.m. Eastern. Uh, if you can, we do live calls, live, we have a live chat. Uh, we have a lot of fun. It's me, former Michigan quarterback, not Major League Baseball pitcher David Cohn, and my brother who played wide receiver at Western State, Colorado, um, and turns into a flaming dragon on Friday. Emphasis on the word flaming. But yeah, and also we uh, <laughs> rent a movie, Lady Ballers. Check it out. Uh, incredible. I, <laughs> I love it. Um, so seven, so seven thirty, so six thirty. Your time. You guys, are, early bird gets the worm. Dude, man. yeah. I hop out the bed like I'm possessed. Yeah, bro, because you're you're fired up, and that, so it means tell me you're that jazzed up at, at five o'clock in the morning. I imagine getting up like like, and this. Is oh, dude, I get up. Like, I get up about four, but my time. I'm talking Central Time. I because I'm a routine person. Like I got to go through. Like yeah, I, uh, my yeah, morning figured. routine of like getting yeah. in the shower, like do all that sure. stuff. It's it's I think I may be on the spectrum, like on some point, honestly, that's not even a joke. Um, but I'm not looking for love. I'm already married. So, um, oh but, but when I, when I, again, I hate to keep going back to the coaching thing, but these hours compared to coaching hours, when I used to have to, when I was younger and having to coach Juco and I was having True. to wake up at four 30 in the morning to go see if I could just find guys. Like this is just a totally different. I, I love. I cannot wait to get up in the morning and go talk about Kirk Cousins being the greatest negotiator of all time. If he was a hostage negotiator, nobody would. It would never go bad. It would just always somehow the ho, the 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 kidnapper would pay the hostages money at the end of the day. So we have a lot of fun <laughs> talk college. We got Ron Slay from SEC Network coming on tomorrow. I know Tennessee or Florida fans just love him. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe if that's the episode you want to catch or not, but I'm high on Florida basketball, Sheldon. And I was one of the first people to say it. I was let's, one of the first people to say it. Now everybody's just hopping on the bandwagon. So let's talk about it. You, you posted this photo. It said, uh, who, who do you got? <laughs> I came in from, from the clouds. It's like not all You just come in hot dog. <laughs> like, and I, listen, I respect it. I think descent moves us forward, but you were like, I was like, who do you got? You're like, not Auburn. I was like, well, my sleeper's Florida. So kiss my ass, Shelton. I'm still bitter about it, bro. I look, it's not even I don't personal. know. Like, what did I do? Like, it's I not, even, like it's I not even you. Something. It's not you. It's not even I, I have I have zero beef with Auburn. I think it's just the national media love for Auburn. Like, I just want to I just want a fair fight. You know, I just want to know what's going on here. What am I missing? What's you paying them? Okay, what's Freeze got going on out there? I used to like I appreciate Auburn. They're the they're the orange and blue. But it's just over the yeah. last two years, it's it's become I love personal. The state of Florida. It's become personal. I love it. I'll drink a bushwhacker <laughs> quicker than anybody's ever seen. Uh, look, it's all love. It's all love at the end of the day. <laughs> I, lo- I love it yeah. though. But yeah, you pick Florida. You got them going far. Uh, so when they play Thursday, I'm thinking Georgia should should be able to handle Mizzou. It'd be a nice little uh, reunion there with Mike White. That that's been a fun little game for these past two. The past two times we played them this year was at a very interesting game. Florida tried to blow it twice, but something interesting for for Florida, which I think is a pro for Florida, is we're on a neutral playing ground. Thank God. And you even yeah. t- tweeted, I think somewhere sometime during the season, like. Man, if you had if these tournaments are played on home field or home home court, who knows what would happen? And I think that's that college basketball is what makes it so so exciting is you see the ebbs and flows. Florida plays Bama at Bama, loses by ten. Plays Florida at Florida against Bama, wins by twenty. Does it's not even close, right? It's two different teams. Yeah. Well, I mean, who could really win on the road this year in the SEC? Like it's yeah. it's it's the bloodletting. I mean, there was Florida and. And listen, I'm low key kind of pissed at Florida. They blew a five team parlay that I had at, at Vanderbilt. Come on, guys, can we get the ball inbounds? Like Walter Tough. Clinton, can we please get the ball inbounds? Um, but yeah, look, it's it's just like playing on a neutral site and anything. What travels, right? Defense travels, rebounding travels. Um, you know, Always not turning it. the ball over travels. And Florida, I think, has a little bit of everything. I mean, you look at the length, Samuel, uh, Hanglockton. That other Denton, that other white tree y'all Condon. got running around. And then you, yeah, Condon. I, for some <laughs> reason, I keep wanting to call him Denton. Uh, but you have old guards, Clayton, Pullen. I, I, I mean, what, what Todd Golden, who's a Bruce Pearl disciple, let's be honest, that's, that, was, that was his mentor. He's from the Bruce Pearl tree. Um, he did an unbelievable job in the transfer portal. And I love the style that they play. I love the way that, that he manages the game from a time frame of who plays when. I think a lot more goes into that than what people think. But I think Florida's rebounding. 
right? Incredible. That's the th that was the craziest part about them losing at Bama. That's the only which was shocking. They got a rebound, right? It's that they got out rebound, and then Bama comes to Florida, and they just shoved them in a locker and ran away, pointing and laughing. So when I look at Florida, it seems like they're starting to figure it out. I know they just lost at Vanderbilt, but sometimes that can be a blessing. You don't have to. Everybody was talking before that about Florida can do this. Florida can do that. Florida could kill a giant with a wiffle ball bat. But then you go and and see that that um you you can see that they have all the tools to be able to make a run, right? When shots aren't falling, I think defensively that's where they've made their biggest strides. And if you look at the last four weeks on Torvik, Florida is like one of the top 15 teams in the country, even after the loss to Vanderbilt. So I think they they continue to grow as one. I think they're going to beat whoever wins Georgia, Missouri. I tell you that Missouri Georgia game though, I I wouldn't sleep on Missouri winning that one. Georgia's beat up. They're very they really struggle defensively, and and Missouri's like average is like forty eight years old uh, on on their team. And these are the last time a lot of these guys are going to play, even though they're built funny. Uh, and then I think Florida will win that game, and I think they beat Alabama. I think they beat Alabama in a neutral site, and then you get Kentucky. I mean, who's just hotter at, than Hansel at the male model awards right now? So uh, as far as SEC tournament, that's great. Florida's in the big dance. I think they could make a run and really hurt some people's feelings in the NCAA tournament because I still think they can sneak up on people. And I mean, they're huge, and that that's just that's how it is. Yeah, and this I was so Florida, uh, you know, the fan base went absolutely nuts when they lost to Vandy, and I was like, I get it, it sucks. Like you hate to see it, whatever. There, and this is exactly what you said. I was talking about, buddy. I said two things can happen. One, this could be the start of a complete failure of a season. Like you just you f lose all lust that you had because of this loss to Vandy, or it's like baseball. Sometimes you need to lose at the right time. There's a ball about getting hot at the right time, but it's also good to kind of get punched in the gut at the right time. For me, this was the perfect punch in the gut. It reminded you, like, hey, you're not this hot shot just coming off a 21 against Alabama. Get a little bit of humble pie. It literally did nothing for the season outside of crush your ego a little bit, which I'm okay with, headed into a big tournament like this, especially when you're going to play a Georgia versus Mizzou. It's a Vandy-esque yeah. type of situation where you could kind of get caught sleeping. I liked it. Well, sometimes it's good when she leaves you on red. Like, so sometimes it is. Sometimes you need that, right? You're probably working out a lot. Right, looking better. Maybe you lost a lot of weight. You look better in high school. You got a good job. The four hundred one k's pumping. You need a heat which, check, you know, Jake. right now. You need a heat check. Yeah, heat check. Yeah, a little heat check. But you should thank your lucky stars that you weren't on the bubble and lost that game. Because that one, that one, you're kind of in that perfect honey hole of you're in the tournament. Uh, it's kind of a gut check, a reality check going into the SEC tournament, but it's not going to cost you from making the big dance. And Todd Golden, he'll get those guys together. You were coming off a, a big high, right? We see this in basketball a lot, and I think especially SEC fans. We're so used to it being like, hey, Kentucky's really good, and then sometimes Florida's good, sometimes Tennessee's good. We're not all used to being this good. Like, so they treat it like it's football. Like, oh my God. Oh my God, we lost a game. We're done. We're cooked. To Vanderbilt? It's like, this is a totally different animal than football, which that's part of the process of learning to become an everything school. Yeah, that's that's part of it too. That's why I try to calm. I don't even try to calm down anymore. It's like, look, like, not that it's good. You don't want to lose. I'm not saying no, you no, want to lose. No, no, but it's but like it's take. Hey, it's not the same. Not the same level of it. Look, can, exactly is right. it fair to well before this? But look, I, I agree with you uh, cold heartedly. I think what excites me about this team when you go into the tournament, the SC tournament's not even going to give you a true picture. I believe what Florida's going to be able to do because now you're playing. You're going to be against teams that you've been playing against all year. They they got your number a little bit when you go into they the know tournament. You. Yeah, they know yeah. you, right? It's just like playing in the SEC. You're going into the tournament. It's like going to college for the first time. It's like nobody knows who I am. I can be whatever I want to be, right? I'm going to be emo for a couple yep. of months, and that doesn't work out. Doesn't 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 matter, right? You can Listen do whatever my you want. Chemical romance and be pissed. Yeah, at my right. Dad. Yeah, <laughs> like you can be whatever you want. So, like your brother was when he uh, uh, did Jimmy Butler. So, oh God, that was that was <laughs> good, good stuff. incredible. Nightmare I love fuel. <laughs> Nightmare fuel. <laughs> so, what excites me though is like you said, they have the bases, and usually in early on these tournaments, teams go cold. Your shooter goes cold a little bit. And what do you resort to is the basics. You said defense and rebound it, and we mm -hmm. dominate. And what I love, too, is the guard position, like you said, with Clayton and Pullen, is you got a guy and two and two guys, in a sense, that you can, if you're just not feeling it, if you don't have your rotation passing the ball well, those guys don't give a shit. Just give me the ball. They know how to play. And that is a key yeah. component that— And Florida Richard's coming along, too. Richard's been coming along finally the second half of this year, giving them that scoring threat as well. Sure. But, yeah, again, who wins— 
in tournament formats that are single elimination, sudden death. It's the teams that can win in the most ways, right? It's not always going to be a track meet. It's not always going to be a rock fight, but you've got to be able to win in both circumstances. That's Florida's how you that. string. Yeah, that's exact. And Florida can do that. They've shown you the ability to do that. Um, and, and they're huge and can rebound, right? That, that's just, that, it's, that's the run game. Of, of basketball. That's what it is. If I can line up and Good just point. run it down your throat or pound it inside or get offensive rebounds and get fouled and get putbacks and tips and I'm adjusting shots, that's the run game of basketball. And they've been doing that well. So, look, man, it's been the, the basketball has made a weird switch over the last couple of years. I've talked about it a little bit last year, kind of the blue buds, blue bloods of schools going away. Like, the Final Four was weird. You had Connecticut, which is somewhat of a blue blood, San Diego State, Miami, and... Uh, FAU. FAU, eight seed. Yeah. And so you're losing these blue bloods because it's one and done. And so these schools like a San Diego State and a UConn and FAU that like you just got to kind of zoo where they've been building for the last nine years because of a COVID year, they're just, they're stacked. They've got guys been playing together forever. So they're able to make a good run in the, in the tournament, which also alludes to they've got a good run game. They've got a good base. They're able to win multiple ways because they've been playing together for so long. Do you feel the SEC has kind of taken over that ACC uh, you know, powerhouse for basketball over the last. I mean, it's if, yeah, right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> let, let let's be honest. I mean, is the ACC is way or the SEC is way better than the the ACC Top to this bottom. year? I mean, it's I thick. would say they're way better than the Big Ten, right? Yeah. I think it's the SEC and the Big Twelve this year. I really believe that. And the Big Twelve, I, I firmly secretly believe good. Shelton, Big Twelve is secretly good. Is, they are, but like I think there's anti SEC bias in college basketball because we dominate in football so much. I really believe that. That's why Kansas can be ten and eight in conference and still be ranked like eleventh in the country, which <laughs> yeah. makes absolutely no sense at all. It's a good point. Um, but yeah, I, I think you can make an, and I've seen Seth Greenberg talk about it. A guy I got a lot of respect for. I've seen Jimmy Dykes talk about it. A guy a lot of got, got a lot of respect for. The SEC is probably the best conference in the country this year in college basketball but i've always said this when you pump money into something when you have the passion that the sec fan bases have and you bring in these type coaches when the sec wants to dominate a sport it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when look at college baseball look at college softball and now we're getting oklahoma y'all are screwed look at college gymnastics look at college golf if they played quidditch Give us four years, let us get some NIL going, and we'll have Harry Potter's kid in here just running shop on everybody. <laughs> I uh, <laughs> that's spot on with it. Look, I will argue the the downfall of the SEC, which probably they haven't gotten the crown yet, and I think you nailed it on the head too. That there is some bias. I think that's spot on. Because kind of like how FSU got a little dust in this past playoff voting because yeah. of the conference that they're in, uh, is that the SEC hasn't got it done yet. That's the big thing. Yeah. The yeah, Tennessee I mean, teams, you, Alabama teams that come in, they're like the most favorite teams of all time. They they just don't get it done. And so that's where the Big 12 comes into play, where Kansas always finds to pull it out. You got the UConn coming from the clouds and the Big East or whatever conference they're playing in. Villanova always finds, right? You always have that random team that gets it done, that always carries the, the torch for the non, mm -hmm. for every other conference. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, we, it, Kentucky won it with Anthony Davis because he was a monster. That's really the only one and done, you know, group team that but I can I mean, that was what how, yeah, but that was, but that was even during a time when the SEC, that was just Calipari. Right? For, for sure. For that sure. Just for the sure. I mean, that was really right. just Anthony Davis. I mean, to be honest, <laughs> yeah. but, uh, you've had South Carolina make a final four. You've had Auburn make a final four. I think a lot of it is experience. I think there's a lot of teams in the SEC that don't have a lot of experience in the NCAA tournament. And when you've made as sure. many NCAA tournaments in a row as Jay Wright and Villanova has, or, or you know, Kansas has with Bill Self, or, or Roy Williams when he was at North Carolina, I mean, you understand how to play in it. I mean, this isn't a symptom that that is just, you know, beholden to the SEC. But, I mean, now, Shelton, with the transfer portal the way it is, um, with kind of the rules of leaving to the NBA, there's more parity now than I can remember. So I just think it's it's a crapshoot. That's what I really think at this point. Who the hell knows, right? Like, like when am I going to watch, you know, what what small school named after a saint is going to make a Final Four run this year that I've never heard about? You know, I'm down there watching uh, Towson play Charleston, and I'm like, all right, which one of you guys? I'm telling you, and you look at Drake, the team that just beat Indiana State in their conference championship game, they've got a lot of pieces Coach's son's the best player. They've got a tree. Everybody can shoot. 
two white guys wearing the headbands just make a bunch of hustle plays and hit clutch shots. Love those like guys. Like, it's just, it's, it's, <laughs> They're dangerous, it, man. They're dangerous uh, yeah, in the they tournament. Are. It's basketball. It's it's one game. It's one game. So yeah. it's not a series, which I love. I think it makes it better. But uh, I don't know who's gonna who's gonna who's gonna ruin my bracket this year. I can't wait to find out. Those two chocolate, those two white boys with a headband are like a chocolate chip and a brownie. You know, you're 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 not ready for it, but you're so pumped when you get that crunch. You're like, oh, that was that was good. For right? sure. That's for what those sure. guys like, are. Who's, why is the mayor's son out here dropping 26 in the Sweet 16? <laughs> I love it. Look, five bucks for Professor. He says, you think he's bad on Twitter, Jake. Try working for him. I'm not that bad. Right. The Professor. The professor. Jake, What's we, up, were, brother? We, we were rolling for an hour, man. I appreciate you. I didn't think we were going to go that long, but we were rolling. It's been a while. I uh, I appreciate you hopping on here and chopping up with me. Uh, the, the chat was going nuts. They, your analogies, your movie quotes, just they're always a blast. You're always a pleasure, man. Well, look, I appreciate it. Uh, lo- you know, love what you guys are doing. Uh, ready? For- I'm already ready for. I know football season. You know, quote unquote, no off season, whatever. But I'm ready for the games to start. I'm not talking about the UFL. I'm somewhat excited about the UFL because it is football, and I love it so much. <laughs> but I'm I'm ready. I'm ready for fall to get here. Right? They they now have you can adjust your own multi view on YouTube TV. I don't think Huge. I've ever been as excited about anything in my life. Uh, as opposed to that, so uh, I'm glad they no, listen. Be fun and they got and... the last button too. I don't know if you know that. Because yes, that, yes, that a big oh deal. yeah, yeah. No, it's a big deal. It's it's. What do we say? What do we say about Florida? It's the little things, right? Keep your foot behind adds the up. line. It adds Let up. us build our own multi view. Now all of a sudden, it's an, I'm immersed in a great experience. <laughs> love it, Jake. Uh, I appreciate it, man. You be good. Thank you, sir. And uh, until next time, man. We'd love to have you back on as always. Hey, for sure, man. Listen, don't quit yet, guys. Don't quit yet. It's gonna be okay. Disney Gator. <laughs> I love it. Did you get it? See you, <laughs> See you, man. All right, boys and girls. Fantastic show there with Mr. Jake Crane. That was a uh, look. Jake's always a blast. Uh, <laughs> he's so good, man. I love you guys for hanging out with us for an hour. Great Monday show. Uh, good stuff. The chat was going bananas. Sorry, guys. When I'm in, the, in those rhythms, I try not to read the chat too much just because I try to be immersed uh, <laughs> yeah, into uh the the uh interview there but you guys were were rocking and rolling here man so look what was exciting and again you guys are gonna hate me for i saw q in here talking for some shit too is a lot of the things we've been saying i think jake paints the picture a little bit a a little bit better and jake is kind of like the uh the friend that comes in and tells you what your wife's been saying the entire time right like i've been telling you this shit but it doesn't doesn't count because i'm telling you um, and it's like when your wife tells you like, Hey, like you, you're putting on a few pounds. You're like, you're just saying that you don't really mean that. And then your buddy comes over like, you're fat as shit, dude. You're like, all right, maybe, maybe I put on a few. Right. So there's, <laughs> that's, that's how that was. And it was kind of cool to, in my opinion, to have those conversations and, and get his thoughts and opinions about it. And he, like I said, he's going to, he's going to cut it the way it is. He's still, put, <laughs> I love how he hyped this all up. <laughs> it's right. Five and five and five. And he's like, yeah, five and seven. <laughs> and look, a lot of it is a schedule. Schedule is going to be tough, but you guys be good. I love you. Good to see you. Happy Monday. You know we're going to see you on Wednesday, the best day of the week, when old Swolder brings it in here. And uh, rock and roll. Breaking news, Braves still suck. You suck. <laughs> I love you, boys. Be good. Until next time. Peace. Love, baby. <laughs>